James chapter 2, and in the Church Bibles, we're on page 1,213. James chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. Favoritism forbidden. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him. But you have dishonest, dishonored the poor. It is not the rich who are exploiting, sorry, is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you to, into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Amen. Please do keep those Bibles in front of you. And let's just read verse 1 again, shall we? My brothers and sisters, writes James, the brother of Jesus, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. I love the simplicity of that encouragement. If you follow Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism towards other people, as in don't prefer some people over others. If you're a Christian, you aren't to show favoritism, says the word of God. And this continues as we study this passage today, our sermon series on love. A sermon series that I've entitled, A New Command, because Jesus said in John 13, a new command I give you, speaking to what would be the church a new command I give you love one another as I have loved you so you must love one another and as you'll have seen from the flag outside you'll see it in the get connected stand we've got this new logo of open doors and I've posed this question to us before but it's worth repeating as we open the doors of this church as we welcome people in as we go out to spread the good news as we open the doors of our hearts the question remains is what kind of community would people find here you know, if someone were to join us today, and if you are here today for the first time, you are so welcome. But if you were to come here, what kind of community would people find? What do they understand about who God is through the way that we treat one another? And we've considered various things. We've considered Jesus' command. We've considered a couple of weeks ago, as Helen came to speak, what it meant to show hospitality to people. And if we've considered what to do, if you like, this week, we're considering what not to do. And it's verse 1. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. And as we go through this passage, we're going to see that this gives us an honest account of our hearts. I think it speaks today into some specific things, and then it also shows us how to live. So let's go through this passage together. Let's consider what, what God might be saying to us as we open the doors of our church. So verse 1 again. Believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. And as James write this, he gives a pretty clear example, I think. We've just had it read. Let's read it again. Suppose a man comes into your meeting, this is verse 2, wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but you say to the poor man, you sit there or you stand over there, you sit on the floor by my feet, haven't you discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? 
Now, we wonder if James here is speaking into a specific example of the time. Notice the kind of culture of honour that's happening and the real distinction between rich and poor, really clearly seen in what people wear. But he isn't just speaking into the time. There's four elements here that shows us what favouritism is. Firstly, in James' example, favouritism, treating others differently, has to do with externals. Notice, James contrasts a man with fine clothing. He's got the bling to match. He's got the rings. And a poor person in filthy clothing. And he doesn't say anything about them in this example to the church, apart from what they're wearing. So and he says, if you judge people just on external things, if you treat them differently just on how they look, you're showing favoritism. So firstly, favoritism here is defined by external things. And then the second element that I would point out is that it's all based on a quick assessment. Notice verse 2, suppose a man comes into your meeting and a poor man also comes in. It's a quick assessment. As in someone walks in and you immediately judge something about them based on the appearance. So if you make a quick assessment of people that's just quite shallow, you're guilty of favoritism. Because that's what favoritism does. That's what prejudice does. It makes quick and speedy assessments of people just based on shallow things. So favoritism here is based on externals. It's based on a quick assessment. And this leads to what I would call a change of behavior. The assessment leads to a change in behavior. What happens? Look at verse 3. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Haven't you discriminated? So the judgment that's based on externals, that's based on a quick assessment, a shallow assessment, leads to a change of behavior. And there's a, a final element here that we should point out, and it's a deeper one. Perhaps we might say it's bad motives, sinful motives. Verse 4. If you act like this, if you show favoritism like this, have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So what this kind of external behavior shows is the internal narrative of our hearts and minds. If you act like this, says James, it reveals the state of your mind. Because what you've just thought about someone very, very quickly has come out. And when you act like this, when you judge people on externals, when you make a quick assessment, when it changes your behavior, it reveals your bad motives. And that, says James, is favoritism. And there's to be no place for favoritism in the church. That's our takeaway from today. If you want the one-liner, favoritism, partiality, prejudice, discrimination has no place in the church of God. And here James is giving a specific example, isn't he? And it's specific to the time in some ways. You think about rich and poor and the way they're dressed and so on. But it holds true at all times for all Christians in all places. So for Central Church in Bristol in 2024, in August, and for the years to come, we are not to be a church, we are not to be people who act like this, who show prejudice, who discriminate, and specifically here, who show favoritism. Now perhaps... You might be able to relate to this um, passage today, not by how you think you've treated other people, but how other people have treated you. You know, it's not my place to apologize as well on behalf of other church leaders, but if someone, especially in a church leader position, you feel like has judged or discriminated against you in this kind of way, I'm so sorry. You know, if you read this today and you're like, that feels like how I've been treated, maybe not with where I've been told to sit or stand, but in just in someone's action. I'm so sorry. And if, if I ever treat you like this, can you just please lovingly tell me and give me the chance to apologize and repent to God? Because this isn't how any of us are to treat one another, but certainly not those in leadership. I wonder if you can relate to people making judgments about you on how you look. What's come up three times in the past week and a half is people basically saying that I look too young to be a vicar. <laughs> oh, you're, oh, you're a vicar? They sort of look me up and down and yeah, I'm wearing flip-flops today and you know, I'm just, I'm just who I am. Maybe I should be wearing something different. Maybe I should, I've got some vicar robes. Maybe that's what I should be wearing. I mean, what I do need to do though, I think is revel in the fact that people think I'm too young to be vicar because there's gonna come a day when they go, yeah, you look like a vicar. <laughs> Not looking forward to that. 
I don't know what image they have in mind of a vicar anyway. Maybe it's the vicar of Dibley. Maybe it's someone who's older. And I don't mind that. That's absolutely fine. But being treated differently based on how you look and a quick assessment is very painful, isn't it? So maybe as you relate to this today, it's not just about your own behavior and you think about your heart, but you would just think about, I can see this in how I have been treated. The other way we might think about this is what this speaks into with this specific example is a tendency that all of us can fall into. Do you know the phrase PLU? PLU, people like us. Or, to give it another phrase, what do birds of a feather do? Birds of a feather, thank you very much, Jackie, flock together. Our natural tendency as humans can be to relate to people who are just like us or who we perceive are just like us. And it's interesting to see where this comes out. You know, I think this, I saw this at Vicar College. So Vicar College, you go to Theological College, you do some training, and there's people from all over the country at the college I was at in London. But what I noticed is that people kind of ended up hanging out with people who were just like them. A certain age, this was interesting, a certain kind of church. All the people from all the biggest churches became friends. Isn't that interesting? PLU, we all like it. People like us, birds of a feather. But here's my contention. Here's what I think the words of God tells us. Is that's not how we are meant to be. That is our natural tendency. We do feel comfortable with people just like us. But we aren't to show favoritism. We aren't to discriminate on certain people. In the short term, like this example here, this kind of quick assessment, but also in the long term. So this speaks not just into how we treat one another when we first meet each other, but our friendships and our relationships. And it speaks into how we relate to one another here. Do you only talk to the same kind of people? Who do you invite around your house? If you're going to be hospitable, and can I encourage us all to do that? Let's be a church that invites one another around for Sunday lunch, or you can invite yourself around my house if you like. That's absolutely fine. I've got enough space. Do you only do that with people who are just like you, or you think it might be easy? Or do you kind of play something out here, even if it's a bit uncomfortable to talk about, where maybe will it be easy to invite that certain kind of person? Do you show favoritism? Of course, there's different kinds of favoritism, isn't there? What's the most socially acceptable form of discrimination there is? Well, you might say, well, it's about a certain kind of sports team, or, you know, everyone hates the English. The Euros recently, everybody hates the English. Scotland, Ireland, Wales, the rest of the world hating the English. An acceptable form of discrimination, I think, would be discrimination against people that are perceived as wealthy. It's okay, probably, to bash the rich, isn't it? What do people do when people drive past in very flashy cars? Well, they call them rude words normally. I mean, obviously, I never do that. But there are different kinds of discrimination. But what God's word says to us is that if we show favoritism, partiality, to use the older words, it's sin. Look at verse 9 with me. If you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you don't commit adultery but you do commit murder, you've become a lawbreaker. And the point he's making is if you, if you, if you sin, you're guilty before the Lord. And so you might rank sins in some way and you say, well, surely favoritism, that can't be as bad as murder. But what James is pointing out is if you are sinful before the Lord, and we all are, then we've broken the whole law. So whether it's adultery or murder or favoritism, we sin. And that sadly can be our tendency, can't it? To treat one another in different ways, to make this kind of assessment of people. But how does God love us? How does God treat people? I wanna give us a series of verses because you see that in verse 1, James says, Believe us in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, aren't to show favoritism. So what does God love like? Well, if you look at Deuteronomy 10, when Moses was given the Ten Commandments, he says, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality. 
And partiality is another way of saying God doesn't have favorites. That's how God loves. He doesn't have favorites. Look at Romans 2, 11. For God does not show favoritism. Job 38, 18 to 19. Is God not the one who shows no partiality to princes and does not favor the rich over the poor? For they are all the work of his hands. Notice that God doesn't value what the world values. We might value those who are wealthier or we perceive as more important or have status, but that's not what God does. Job, God shows no partiality. That's just what Jesus like. That's just what Jesus was like. Matthew 22, verse 16. The Pharisees are speaking to Jesus and they say, Teacher, we know that you're true and teach the way of God truthfully. And you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Isn't that interesting? The Pharisees picked up on Jesus that he didn't treat people differently based on their appearance. Jesus wasn't swayed by externals, because that's what God's like. This famous verse is from 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. You'll remember it and know it, I'm sure. But the Lord said to Samuel, as he was trying to find the king that God had chosen, don't consider his appearance or his height, but I've rejected him. For the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God doesn't judge us. He doesn't judge people on the outward appearance. He looks at our hearts as in he looks at what's within. The heart is the biblical seat of all your will and your emotions and your mind. And that is what the Lord looks at. If you were to flick across in your Bibles to James 4 verse 6, James writes that God opposes the proud but shows favour to the humble. God opposes the proud but shows favour to the humble. You do not want God in opposition to you. You don't want that. But what, are the, what does the Lord look for? When he looks at our hearts, when he doesn't judge in the way that we can be tempted to do sometimes, what does he look for? He looks for humility. He looks for a humility, that kind of posture of lowering oneself. And this is exactly what James picks up. Look at verse 5. As he gives this challenge to the church, as he says, if you treat people in this way, you're showing favoritism. Look at verse 5. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? Hasn't God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom? What James is pointing out is that God shows favor to the humble. Who are the most humble? Well, sometimes it's the people with the least. It's not that you couldn't be humble if you were wealthy. But do you remember what Jesus said? He said, it's harder for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God than it is for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. Which I just thought was an amazing illustration. There's a, a hill in Shropshire called the Rekin, which is where Neil and my dad grew up. And it's, it's a pretty lovely hill as far as hills go. And there's a spot at the top where a hole has formed in a rock. And it's just big enough for one person to go through. And what's it called? It's called the eye of the needle. And Jesus pointed out, he said, wealth can make it hard for you to know me, which is what entering the kingdom of God means. And why would wealth do that? It's because wealth can puff you up. Status can puff you up. Being able to buy nice things, go on nice holidays, have a bigger house, have a good car, send your kids to a certain school, whatever it was. Wealth can puff us up. But those whom the Lord receives are humble in heart. So James points out to the church, he's like, you're trying to big up, you're trying to give the people who might most be opposed to God the place of honor, but the people that the Lord looks on, the humble, you are the pushing them away. And that, he says, is sin. Don't show favoritism. We must never show favoritism to the wealthy, and we must never discriminate in this way. So what's the example for us? In 2024, in this church, in this place, or this nation, however we want to class it, what's the example for us? Let's not show favoritism based on dot, dot, dot. How people speak. Accents, for instance. 
you ever do that? Based on how someone talks? Oh, they sound a bit dot, dot, dot. You know, it's been interesting to come here and to talk to people with very strong Bristol accents. And I love a strong Bristol accent. I've been in uh, like a South London bubble for a bit too long. I love a Bristol accent. Going um, uh, the other day, where was I? Even at New Wine, actually, just meeting people. We're in the impact venue. There are people with proper, like, Geordie accents. Love it. But do you ever judge based on how someone sounds? Do you ever make assessments about what they might be like? How about the way people dress, just to use this example here? Do you ever make quick assessments about people on the way that they dress? And you assume things about them based on how they look. Oh, that vicar's wearing flip-flops. He can't be taken seriously. What might it be? In this country, and I saw this again in London, the thing that seemed to cut through sort of all ways that we might want to divide people up would be class which is a complex thing in this country, class. We class that complex relationship of like upbringing, accents, schooling, outlook, and so on. And what I found that really was alienating to people of all kinds of backgrounds was the perception of other people's wealth. So I would be um, in a, it was a pretty wealthy church for the people who were pretty like well-educated, yuppies, basically, elite in the modern terminology. You know, they had good, quote-unquote, professional jobs. They'd gone to good, quote-unquote, universities and so on. And yet those kinds of young people would be put off by people who were just like them because they thought, oh, there's some barrier here between us. I'm not part of this group. And what I wanted to point out to a couple of people is you are just like this based on the scriptures you've used. In fact, you're, the way you are might be off-putting to some other people. That's how sort of a barrier it was. The thing is, God's church is meant to be different. Believers in our glorious church, Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism, as in we only prefer people of a certain class or accent or whatever it was. The one I think that we have to mention here would be race or to, you know, skin colour, ethnicity, however you want to talk about that. And this is something that I don't feel particularly comfortable about, comfortable talking about. Because I haven't known discrimination based on my skin color. But some people still experience that, and they experience that here. And the church has the strongest answer to racism. Believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism to make judgments about people and how they look, especially about characteristics about which they have no control, like where they were born and their skin color. But we must be careful, I think, to not just go along with the world on this. Since 2020 and the murder of George Floyd, I think the West has had a bit of reckoning with race. How do we treat people? How does our society treat people? What are the outcomes like for people of different backgrounds? But the world, I think, I would, and I would suggest, is looking for answers to things that it doesn't quite have the answers to. So how do you honour characteristics about people and culture without making that the only thing about them? So Ben Lindsay, um, a man, he's a pastor in London, he wrote a book and it was called We Need to Talk About Race and it was written to the church and it was written to often white majority churches in this country. And the basic point was we need to acknowledge that race is still a factor in this country for people. And the experience of being a minority ethnic person in this country can be different to being white. So don't just assume that we're all the same. So actually he said we need to not just have a colour blindness, but almost a kind of colour consciousness. But maybe that can get us into trouble too. Kamala Harris is um, going to be the nominee for the Democrats for the presidential election this year. And she's there because she was chosen as Joe Biden's vice presidential nominee. And what did Joe Biden do when he said that he was going to choose a nominee? He said, I'm going to choose, very specifically, a black woman. He said, very specifically, of all the talented people that he could have chosen, that he would choose a black woman to be his running mate. And then Trump has come along, classic Trump, and pointed out, well, he's in a kind of criticism, he said, well, you're only here because you're a black woman. 
you know, you were only chosen for this role because of your characteristics. He called her a DEI hire, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now, who's at fault there? Well, we might want to say that Trump is, because he's just criticizing someone. He's putting them in a box, saying, you're only there because of your characteristics. We might want to say that he's discriminating there. But we might also want to say that if you choose someone just based on their characteristics, like Joe Biden explicitly said he was going to do, then that might be the natural response. We as Christians have the solution that the world is seeking. The world is seeking, the world is seeking equality. And it's based on a Christian idea that comes from Bible verses like this. But I suggest that the world is asking questions that it doesn't quite have the answer to. How do you value the whole person? How do you value the whole person and not just value them for their skin color, which is called tokenism, and would also be kind of a favoritism that is found in this passage? How do you value the whole person and not just make assessments that are skin deep, whether it be negative discrimination, racism, or positive discrimination, which is still discrimination? How do you do that? Well, we've got to act in this way. Look at verse 8 with me. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. This is James' answer to the favoritism that he was pointing out in the church. Don't show favoritism to one another. Don't show partiality. Instead, do this. Keep the royal law found in Scripture. Love your neighbor as yourself. And it's interesting that he uses the word royal here. Royal for the king. And this is what I suggest the world is seeking, as I just even give that example of Kamala and Harris and Trump. It's like the world wants the kingdom of God. It wants an equality and an equity between humans. But it wants the kingdom of God without the king. It wants the kingdom of God without the king. The only one who can bring judgment. Which is, by the way, precisely the sin that um, the church is pointing out. The church is falling into that James is pointing out. He says, if you discriminate, if you show favoritism, what you're doing is becoming judges with evil thoughts. Who's the only judge of all the, all the earth? It's the Lord. He's the only one who can judge us fairly without partiality, without favoritism, or without prejudice. And the danger is that we become just like everyone else, even in the church, and we become judges of other people, which is not how we're meant to do. Instead, verse 8, we are to love your neighbor as yourself. Look at verse 12. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. What a wonderful verse this is. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So we aren't to show favoritism. We aren't to slip into things like the sin of racism or homophobia or prejudice. We aren't to treat people differently based on these characteristics. Instead, we are to speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And what he's saying is here is, it's like, live as if it's true. Live as what God says about you is true. You are going to be judged by a law that is actually going to find you free. If you're in Christ Jesus, when God judges every single one of us, for those in Christ Jesus, we're going to be considered spotless and pure and clean. So live like that is true. Let the truth of the gospel change your heart. See, what is true for our church is the only way that we're not going to show favoritism is that the degree to which our gospel shapes, to we, the degree to which the gospel shapes our self-image. So how are we going to be rid ourselves of just showing partiality of favoritism to other people? It's by carrying that humility that God is looking for in our hearts and letting the gospel shape our image. What does the gospel say of all of us? It says that before the Lord, we come to him with nothing. We've got nothing good to offer him. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In this illustration, we are the poor man who comes in in filthy rags. We are the poor man who comes in the filthy rags of our sin and our shame. We've got nothing to offer the Lord. And when he looks on us, both on the inside and the outside, he should judge us. 
But in Jesus Christ, we can receive royal robes. In Jesus Christ, we can receive this great exchange where we receive the righteousness and the new clothes, if you like, the ring on the finger, the cloak over the shoulders of the prodigal son, as God gives us a righteousness that we don't deserve. And that's the thing about the gospel, and that's the thing about God's grace, is we don't deserve God's grace. None of us do. And yet when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, that's exactly what we receive, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, his mercy. And that is what James says to the church. Mercy triumphs over judgment because of Jesus Christ. Therefore, treat other people in the way that you have been treated. Remember that before the Lord, you are absolutely nothing. You're nowhere without Christ. You have no status to put yourself above anyone else. You're like the person in filthy rags. And therefore, since God shows no favoritism, don't fall into that yourself. Instead, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And as we take communion today, and as we go from this place, this is what I'd encourage us to hold in mind. That because of Jesus Christ, we can enter into this kind of exchange. That the one with all the riches of heaven gave it all up for you to give it to you through his broken body and his shed blood. And he calls you today to live out that kind of life. And he calls us together as a church to be the kind of church that shows the true love of God to one another. That doesn't make assessments of people that doesn't judge people based on appearance, that doesn't just be friends with people who are just like us, birds of a feather, but that truly and impartially loves one another. Now, if you hear that today and you think, oh, gosh, that's such a high standard, how am I ever gonna do it? Can I encourage you to come to the Lord's grace today? And even as we take communion, just take communion saying to the Lord, oh God, I wanna live out what you have done for me as you've shown your love in Jesus Christ.